Christmas season is finally here. It is finally amongst us and upon us. And I'm excited about this as we start seeing all the signs of Christmas. You can start seeing all the decorations. I want to give a, a, a big high five, a shout out to the crew of people. Tuesday evening, they came up here and decorated our campus. So let's, let's go ahead and give them a, a little bit of appreciation clap. But all around us, we see Christmas taking off from the lights on the houses to uh, the, the trees that are being put up, all the decorations, all the decor, all the things that are happening, and you can't turn on the TV without he hearing that jingle. And I'm not going to sing it for us, but we all know what we're talking about because that ushers, that ushers in the Christmas season here in Oklahoma, and I feel like it's not right until you hear that that. That song, and I, I heard it this week, so I guess it means Christmas is here. But what I'm excited about more is, is, is not just all the amazing thing, all the hot cocoa and the candy canes and all that fun stuff. What I'm excited about is this morning begins our, our stretch and in anticipation, and it starts the Advent season. As you see, the candle of hope has been lit this morning. I'm super excited about this message series, The Heart of Christmas, because we're going to look through the different hearts, the different aspects of Christmas. We're going to talk about hope this morning. And next week, Pastor Bill will be back and talk about peace and then joy and then love. And we're going to wrap it all up on Christmas Eve at 4 and 6 by talking about Jesus and how he came for us as he came as that great rescuer. So hopefully you're making plans to attend and, and not miss out on a single Sunday of this Advent season. Hopefully you're making plans to say, you know what, this Christmas is going to be something different. I'm going I'm to pledge that my family and myself are going to be there. We're not going to miss out on one, and we're going to bring everybody we can because, not because we want to pack this place out, but because we want to see lives changed and people come in and in, in encounter the true heart of Christmas. In fact, last weekend in the bulletin and this weekend there, there as well, you'll find this yellow or gold card, and it says, count me in. I want to challenge each of us. Maybe, you, maybe you're like, man, I, I messed up on that last week. I didn't fulfill that. But I want to challenge us this week. Grab that. Fill it out. We're going to be pinning it to the cross, but today, if you have a chance to fill it out and say, hey, I'm going to pray. I'm going to invite people. I want to encourage you and challenge you at the end of the state service, just lay them here on these steps, not so I can see them, but because we want to, to rally around. And if you want to put your name on it, I myself will come over and pray over every single one of those names that are left today. This week, I'll be doing that. So if you want to join us in prayer and saying, God, this is your season. This is your purpose. You came as that gift. Count me in because I'm making a commitment to pray. I'm going to make a commitment to invite everybody I know to come and worship with me this holiday season. This morning we're going to talk about hope and the hope that comes through the birth of Jesus. And the last couple of weeks for me have definitely been filled with hope. They've been filled with, with this constant hoping and praying. Um, as I was planning and thinking through this message for a number of weeks, I was hit with a, a, a cough about 10 days ago. I was hit with this pretty bad, and you're maybe like, okay, gear down, little shifter. It's just a cough. It's allergy season in Oklahoma. It comes 343 days of the year. Um, but this was not like a cough that I'd, I'd had. I'd had an accident, so I was hurt on this side, and I couldn't cough, and then finally I was able to cough, and I've ended up pulled a muscle in my abdomen. Don't ask how that happens. Just pray for me. But through this, my voice has disappeared this last week, and I figured I might get a couple of amens, but good. I'm glad you didn't. Blessings upon you and your homes. But through this journey of the last several weeks, and then especially this last week, of trying to be silent to trying to, to save my voice, but also trying to just listen to the Lord and, and pray and say, God, if, if, if it's not me that is supposed to lead this message, God, give me, give me that indication so that someone else could be prepared. And we've got a great staff. I've had a number of people say, hey, if you're not able to go, let me know Friday, Saturday, whatever. I had text messages checking up on me, seeing how my voice is doing. And I say all that to say is, is as I've been thinking about this hope, 
this anticipation of this morning and to see what would come out of it. It, it brought a new light to the word hope. It brought in into this new perspective, if you will, hoping that the Lord would come and touch me and allow me to be here this morning and, and praise the Lord that over the last couple of days, my voice has been getting stronger, and I was actually told to stop talking this morning um, as I was greeting folks, but um, it was done in love, so I appreciate that. But, but this, this idea of hope, now maybe, maybe a more um, common explanation or idea of hope is as we enter this Christmas season is your kids. How many have kids that have already have the long list? One of my nieces actually made a PowerPoint presentation of all the things that they want for Christmas. It was quite comical. But the kids that list out all the things, and then we start watching TV, and all of a sudden there's all these other things that have to be added because of the commercials. But, but think about that child, or maybe you've done this in the past, or maybe your children are doing it now, that write that list, that make that list. There is so much longing and desiring for these things to come on Christmas morning. They hope and they anticipate it, and they desire it without thinking about anything else. For a whole month from the end of November till December 25th, their mind is focused on this. With every commercial that has seen, more things are added. Until that day they unwrap their gifts. Think about that sheer excitement and that, that enthusiasm that is built within that hope of a child. And as I was reflecting upon that this last week, I got thinking about, is that what my heart posture is whenever I start thinking about Christmas and about what Jesus came to come and live on this earth and die on a cross for me? Do I still have that anticipation? Do I still have that hope? Do I still have that desire, that longing, that expectation that, that I can't get enough? Nothing else can, can fill my thoughts and my minds at that time. He, he is all I think about until we get to celebrate his birth on Christmas morning? Or do I let all the distractions of the world come in and distract me and pull me away from the true reason for the season, the true meaning of Christmas, this hope that is at the heart of Christmas? Not the gifts, but the miraculous birth of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Because his arrival here on this earth was a fulfillment of scriptures, of prophecies that have been spoken hundreds of years before. This prophecy was spoken and had become one of the most recognized during this time of year. And we see that prophecy in Isaiah. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Isaiah chapter 9. They're going to be on the screen as well. Isaiah chapter 9, starting in verse 2. And the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. You have multiplied the nations and you have increased its joy. They're, they rejoice because of you, before you. And joy in the harvest, and they are glad when they divide the spoil. Verse 4, for the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in the battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood was burned as fuel for the fire. In verse 6, for unto us a child uh, was born, to us a son was given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. 
What I love so much about this passage of Scripture is this prophecy was written in about 740 B.C., so several hundred years before Jesus came and fulfilled this prophecy. Isaiah wrote this because he heard from the Lord, and he said, one day this child is going to come. It's not going to be like anything you've ever imagined or thought, but this child is going to come. This king is going to be born not like you expect it. And what I love about this, it says he's going to come and he's going to have the government on his shoulders. Now, in this time, Israel, the people of Israel, have been under the leadership of, of four not-so-great kings, some, some corrupt and ungodly kings. We see uh, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. They had led their people from, of Israel far from God. They would led them away from God throughout this time, and they've led them into a dark place. So the time when Isaiah writes this, it's a glimmer of hope. It's this glimpse of of what might be this anticipation of when will this come to fruition? Because we know that the Lord has called, we know that the Lord has, has spoken these words through Isaiah. It would be safe to say that the people of Israel were suffering through the reins of these these leaders. So I love that Isaiah, as he writes these words, he knew God would have to intervene. He knew that it was going to take something far beyond any other king to come and rule, that it was going to take a touch from the heavens to come down and turn their world around. Church, I think there's a lot of similarities in what we're seeing in today's world in today's society and in culture today that go parallel to what we see the Israelites as they're walking through in this time. We need an intervention from the Lord above to come and speak and touch his people, to wake them up and bring them out of the darkness, to bring them into the glorious light. I may get a little excited this morning, church, because this is so amazing that Isaiah penned this so many years before. And we see the people of Israel, they were desperately needing some hope. They were desperately needing some hope. And what I love about this passage is that it makes two statements. Real quick, it makes two statements. First off, in verses 2 through 5, it reveals the acknowledgement that there's brokenness in the world, that there's this darkness that's surrounding Israel, that there's this sin and all this destruction had come and entered in and distracted them and pulled them from their first love. This sin and this corruption had created a brokenness and darkness around much of what we see today, like I said. In my opinion, I believe that we are living in one of the most broken and, and dark times that the society has ever experienced, a world that is desperately needing hope. And this isn't in my notes, but church, guess what? We have the answer. We have the, we have the key to unlock them from the darkness. We have the light that is shining and filling us. Church, we need to be going outside these walls and bringing the light to the darkness because that's what we have experienced. I love that that this passage also says, yeah, there's brokenness and darkness. But in verses 6 and 7, it says, no, but there's a light that is dawning, that there's a light that is coming through the birth of Jesus, that one day Jesus is going to come, and he's going to make all things new. That one day, as, as you're walking through this darkness and this brokenness for so long, and it doesn't seem like there's an end in sight, that one day Jesus is going to say, I have come and I've demolished all darkness. I've taken all brokenness. I've defeated all sin. And I have come to make all things new. We see that also in Matthew. In Matthew chapter 1, we see that, that the book of Matthew reminds us of Isaiah's teachings. And we see the connection that is made between Isaiah's prophetic word and what has actually taken place in the manger. So in Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 22, and this this is being spoken to Joseph. And it says, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. 
Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name the son Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now take, take just a moment, one second, as we look at this, and this is being spoke to Joseph, and think about what might be going through his mind. Hopefully you'll come Christmas Eve, and Pastor Bill's going to give you a little insight into what Joseph might be thinking. But think about the journey that he has been on. We see this young Jewish man. We see Joseph, he's supposed to be, he's engaged, he's supposed to be married to Mary. And yet she's found with child. She's already pregnant. So this just complexes the whole matter, the whole situation. He is faced with an incredibly difficult decision. But what we see here, despite Joseph naturally wanting to end the relationship, Despite him wanting to go along with what society would deem worthy and what all everybody would say, you are you have the right to do this, to flee because she had seemingly been unfaithful. What do we see? The angel comes to Joseph and speaks to him. He comes to him in a dream and tells him to go ahead and proceed in the marriage that it, that Mary has not been unfaithful, rather that she has been chosen as an instrument by the Lord. What I love so much about this is because it defies all a man's mentality and thought processes, but the Lord says, man, I am crafting it to be good. I'm crafting it for something amazing that people are going to be talking about for thousands and thousands of years to come. See, church, maybe there's someone in this place right now that the Lord has called you to something big, and it doesn't make sense to your family. It doesn't make sense to your friends, to your occupation, to your job, your coworkers, but the Lord is in it, and he says, I have called you, and you're saying, God, it makes no sense. Everybody's wondering what's up, but I am here. I'm following you because, God, you take the confusing, and you make something beautiful. God, you are able to take the inept and make someone that, that can come and speak your word. God, you can use the unusable to change lives. And we see Mary, this teenage girl, who is almost to have her, her life and her future just upended and taken away. We see the Lord coming in and the Lord intervening and saying, I've got a plan and a purpose for your life. And we see Joseph obeys and he listens. And I think many times when we read this account in Matthew, I know I've been guilty of it. Christmas Eve or Christmas morning, we get out the big family Bible that you have to have a little red wagon to pull up, and then that's the only time you open it all year is to read the Christmas story. And we read this little portion of the Bible because that's what we're supposed to do. But what I love so much about this, and the Lord hit me with this this week, is that all of this occurred. The, the angel coming to Joseph, the Lord using Mary, who was a virgin, who was a teenager, who was despised maybe by what the, the world might thought she was no good to be used for anything. We see all this comes together to fulfill a prophecy of over 700 years ago. All this comes together to fit into God's plan that, that, that would come to bring a child into the world that would be light in the darkness and hope for all people. And the angel says, you're not going to name him after your family. Instead, his name shall be Emmanuel. God with us. Those three words hit me stronger this week than they ever have. It says, God with us. That means we serve a God who is not distant, who is not on vacation, who does not, uh, hard to reach, but he is a God that is literally with us in this presence, with us, involved in our lives, wanting to know every intimate detail of our life. And that is the God that we serve. What a promise within the name of this child. 
So three things about hope this morning that we're going to process through. First off, we see the presence of darkness in, in Isaiah 9. The presence of darkness targets our hope. Or you may think it may threaten our hope. It tries to attack our hope. The presence of darkness in this world comes and tries to defeat our hope. As we read in Isaiah just a few minutes ago, that there's this darkness all around. You don't have to have me tell you that. You don't have to even read the Bible. You see that you can walk out and see darkness all around in our world and society, even today. And you may be saying, man, point one, the presence of darkness targets our hope. That doesn't sound very uplifting. But what I love is that's not the end of the story. We see that Isaiah prophesied, and we have seen that light has come. See, the center of the Christmas story is focused centrally and directly on the birth of Jesus Christ, him being the fulfillment of Israel's hope that God would push back the darkness, that he would push out the darkness and distinguish the darkness, get it out of here and bring light into the world. I think this is one of the reasons that Christmas is so exciting to us is that we too, we live in a world similar to what the people of Israel did. We live in a world that has so much darkness due to the sin that so easily creeps in to our lives and entangles us. We, too, are, are in such a desperate need for Christ, the Christ child, to usher in light and push out the dark, this darkness that's all around us. So this Christmas season, know that the presence of darkness in this world is going to target and it's going to try to attack the hope that you have, but we have a hope in one that is greater than the darkness. Desmond Tutu says, hope is being able to see that there is light despite all the darkness. Did you catch that? Hope is being able to see that, yeah, there's darkness around, but despite all that, there is light. It was brought up in our worship devotion this morning before the, the worship team was rehearsing. That despite the amount of darkness that you may find yourself in, even a pinprick of light can overcome that darkness. Darkness cannot overcome the light, so whatever little bit of light is shining in the darkness, the light will prevail. Hope is being able to see that there is light despite the darkness, no matter what we're walking through today. And Christmas is a great reminder that whatever we hope for in our lives, whatever that is in our lives that we are desperately longing for, that it is available through Emmanuel, our God that is with us. I thought this is amazing, this thought. Hope is not a result of the absence of conflict, difficulty, struggle, or trials. Brother, hope is a result of the presence of God. This year, as, as you plan for families to get together, and you're saying, man, I know I'm going to expect some conflict, difficulty, struggle, because my family's coming in. But guess what? Hope is not a result of the absence of those issues, the absence of trials. No, it is isn't. The result of saying, God, you are welcome into my home. You are welcome into my family. You are welcome into my workplace. God, every aspect of my soul and my being, you are welcome. Have your way. Have your presence and dwell within me. Hope is a result of the presence of God. Not only is the, the darkness around us that's going to target our hope, but we also see God's presence has come to give us hope. God's presence has come to give us hope. And this is kind of mind-boggling to me, but, but the fact that, just like the Israelites had to do, when Isaiah penned this, the hope that was told about sometimes takes a little bit of time. In this case, it took over 700 years for it to come to fruition. The hard thing about hope is often that it takes longer than what we would like for it to be feel, fulfilled. Isaiah saw that one day, eventually one day, 
that God would bring the great light and salvation to the world through the birth of the child. It wasn't for several hundred years until Matthew actually records the birth of Jesus, the Christ child in Bethlehem. Despite it taking hundreds of years, guess what? It came. It happened. So many times we may not, we may not come to see it come to fruition in our time frame, but we know that God has things planned out for a purpose and are good for our hope and our benefit. I was reading some research and some questions by some pastors online this last week, and, and one of the questions that was posed to him was, well, why is it so important that we look back at Isaiah's prophecy every year at Christmas time? Because it seems like this is the time of year that we seem to draw, dive into Isaiah. It's, it's a complex book at sometimes, but so we're like, we'll save that for Christmas time. Why, why should we look at this pro- prophecy every year at Christmas? Church, I believe that this is a great reminder to us as we look at the faithfulness of God how true and faithful God is and was to his people. The the fact that the people of Israel were longing for a savior so long they were desperately looking and they'd walk through the darkness and God sent a rescuer. God sent a redeemer. Yeah, maybe they were ready for it right then. Maybe it didn't come the way that they planned, but God delivered. He sent them the rescue. I believe it is a great constant reminder for us of the faithfulness of God. That when he promises, he's going to come through. That when he says something, it's going to happen. And I love it. Paul even encourages us. Paul encourages us in Romans to believe, to have hope, as he wrote to the early church in Rome, in Romans 15, 4, it says, for whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Paul reiterates the fact that everything that has been written from the past is meant to give us this endurance and this encouragement to have hope as we say, God, I may not understand what's going on, but you have written it, you've promised it, you've never turned your back on your promises. I'm going to trust and have faith that you're going to carry it to completion because that's the God that you are. And lastly, we see at the heart of Christmas, there's hope. Though there are many, many distractions that are going to fight for our attention during these next four weeks. Though there's so many distractions, and they're good things that come in, but, but they're trying to fight for our time and our focus and our mentality. This message is a reminder that hope is offered to us through the Jesus' birth in that manger. That our God is always right on time. He knows what we need and when we need it. Though many times we think that we have something else in plan and we know a better timeline. He knows what we need and when we need it. And he can be trusted to reveal the light of Christ so that the darkness can be pushed back in our lives. In a world of darkness, a light has come. In a world filled with darkness and brokenness and sin, a perfect son was given to live on this world and not sin once, to come and lay his life down as a sacrifice. In a world of darkness, a light has come to dis- defeat and destroy the darkness. All week, I've had a song running through my head, and I'm not going to sing it, but it's been running through my head, and we've sung it in this very place a number of times. And I think it is so fitting for this to be a, in our minds, for us to remember these lyrics of this song as we leave this place today and go throughout this Christmas season. It comes from the song, Hope Has a Name. And here are some of the words to it. It says, there will be a day my hope complete. 
Now home in glory, your face I'll see. My pain no more, my fear will cease. I bow my life, I fix my eyes on Christ my King. There is a light, salvation's flame. Christ undefeated trampled the grave. See, now the cross be lifted high. The light has come. The light has won. Behold the Christ. Hope has a name. His name is Jesus. My Savior's cross has set the sinner free. Hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. O oh Christ, be praised. I have victory. Church, that is something that we can get excited about because in this world of darkness, in this world of destruction, in this world of hopelessness, we serve a God that defines the word hope. His name is Jesus. He gives us the victory in his name. There is no other powerful name on earth that whenever his name sounds, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that he is Lord. Church, we have a light that has come and trampled the grave. The light has come and the light has won. Behold, it is our Christ. This morning, have we experienced the hope that he brings? Have we experienced that hope, or are we still longing, trying to fill ourselves with things we can manufacture or come up with ourselves? Have we experienced that hope that he brings? Will you allow him to fill you with that hope this Christmas season? Will you allow him to fill you with hope, to push out the dark and bring in the light? Not the hope of gifts wished for or anything of that nature, but the hope in the light and a hope of victory that comes only in his name. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we are so grateful. God, that you have come and you have won so praise to your name, Father. God, we thank you that you are able to dispel all the darkness because of your great and glorious light. So, Father, as we have looked at the hope that comes from you, God, may we walk in that. May this be a Christmas that is like any other Christmas that we've ever experienced because we are walking in the hope that comes from you. So Jesus, we are so grateful. And God, I pray that if there's one in this place that has never experienced that hope, that today would be the day that they turn over full control of their lives to you. That you may have your way. That this would be a Christmas season that they've had an encounter with you. God, we thank you. And now may the hope, the peace, and the joy, and the love represented by the birth of in Bethlehem that night fill our lives and become part of all that we say and all that we do. Jesus, we love you and praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being here. Make sure you don't forget to grab your Count Me In card. Fill it out. I want to pray over them this week. Drop them off here at the, ta uh, at, the, at the steps. And be sure to be back next week, part two, The Heart of Christmas. Thank you so much. You're dismissed.